Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and this space shuttle rendering still haunts my dreams. Specifically, the fact that we have fairings on top of those boosters on the side. The thing is, it's not because it's so ridiculous, but because there is actually an element of truth. There is a good idea here, which was actually investigated by the designers and engineers surrounding the space shuttle program. In one of many studies looking at redesigning and retooling the space shuttle, they considered putting a payload fairing on top of the external tank. I believe this specific proposal is from Rockwell in 1977, before the space shuttle had even launched. The aim was of course to provide larger space for payloads than the shuttle's payload bay could accommodate. The size requirements for the Space Shuttle's payload bay had been set back in 1970, while Apollo was still flying to the moon. NASA insisted that it needed a 15-foot wide bay to accommodate space station modules, and the Department of Defense insisted that they needed a 60-foot long cargo bay to accommodate their new generation of spy satellites. So that's the dimensions we end up with. But even then, there were payloads that might not fit into this. Some components just can't easily be shrunk down to smaller sizes. Back then, mirrors were not things that would fold in half. So by leaving the payload bay empty, they could put their payload in this larger fairing up the front and have a 7 meter mirror if they wanted. So that would allow objects that were about 66% bigger. But the team didn't stop there. They said, well, we could go even bigger with a hammerhead configuration, a 10.6 meter payload fairing. And I know this looks really wrong in many ways, and it begins to look even wronger when you realize that most people refer to the space shuttle with female pronouns. This proposal did get far enough that a concept artist put stuff together. I guess that's the equivalent of getting a CGI render done these days. Yeah, I noticed that this one also is done up with uh, US Air Force logos on it. So whatever payload it's carrying probably isn't a space telescope to look at stars. It's more likely to be a giant spy satellite that's going to be pointing at the Earth. So yeah, to make this work, they would have the payload bay on the shuttle empty. It would carry the entire stack all the way into orbit, and only after it had deployed the spacecraft would it begin the deorbiting procedure. And I'm guessing it would sort of help deorbit, or at least slow the trajectory of the external tank so that it would fall to Earth, you know, sooner. But an even more interesting concept than just some launching something big is using the external tank and repurposing it to be part of the structure for a space telescope. So while you would have a fairing on the front with a mirror and optical assemblies, it would then, it wouldn't open up like a fairing, it would become the sort of core of the telescope. Then they would throw away the oxygen tank, they would throw away the aft part of the tank, and they would be left with a hollow tube, which would be designed to interface with the rest of the telescope. And this is an absolutely fascinating concept. So of course, I felt like I had to share this with the social medias and posted it to my Twitter and was absolutely shocked when none other than Wayne Hale came up in my mentions to say, oh yeah, we could never actually fly this because it would be too dangerous. It would make the real return to launch site maneuver impossible. That is where they had to turn the spacecraft around after ditching the boosters and then drop the tank. The aerodynamic changes that result from having that low density fairing on the front meant that it increased the chance of the uh, external tank essentially recontacting the orbiter and killing the crew. And honestly, I'm sure that's not the only objection that they had, but details are hard to find. I found these particular images in a paper published in 2004. It was a review of all the you know, ideas they'd had over the years of how to rebuild and repurpose the space shuttle, how to slice and dice the designs. And you can see from this table, they came up with a lot of different ideas. In 2004, this was of course following the Columbia disaster and just before Constellation was uh, actually decided upon. So at this point, they were still talking about a shuttle-derived vehicle to do missions to the Moon and to Mars. And based on these historical designs, they propose what they thought the space shuttle should be in the post-Constellation program world.
And this is actually based on a pretty old uh, concept. They would take the space shuttle and just use the propulsion section. You would add the sensors for the avionics, the reaction control thrusters, and that's all. Above that, it would have you know dis expendable uh, upper stages and everything else. So the thing that would return to Earth would be this propulsion section. It would have a heat shield. It would have uh, parachutes. And a certain version of it actually had little stubby wings so that it could actually fly and get you know, somewhat close to its desired landing site before then popping the parachutes and landing safely. And of course, the big argument in this favor is that it used existing solid rocket motors and external tanks, so it would just use the same processing facilities, but you would get a much more, a much cheaper vehicle that didn't get forced to carry people. Another variant here, uh, well, this one if, is of course using the hammerhead fairing configuration, but you'll notice that it also has four external boosters, and those are not solid rocket motors, those are liquid rocket motors. Yeah, they did actually look at using liquid booster motors on the space shuttle with uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen on them. There were also five segment solid rocket motors proposed for being used on the uh, space shuttle. And these will actually fly because, of course, they're going to power the SLS. So while this is one part of the study that did actually come into being, it's also quite possibly the most boring part of the studies in this paper. I mean, it's a shame the space shuttle fl never flew with five second boosters, but at least the space shuttle's engines are going to fly assisted by five segment boosters, huh? Another alternative that was studied was going full-on exhibit and adding boosters to the boosters so that they could get more payload. It turns out they could get another like five tons of payload into space if they added these little extra boosters that got the rocket started and then those dropped off very quickly after launch. Anyway, there were engineers who thought that the 10 meter fairing was still too small for the mirrors they wanted. So they came up with this, a 20 meter lenticular fairing. It's basically uh, a flat fairing. They put it on its side so you can put a 20 plus meter mirror inside of it and then also get placed in the background of a Star Trek set as if you're part of the logical, you know, heritage of the Enterprise. So they would use this to send up a 20 meter mirror and then subsequent missions would fly up and they would attach all the rest of the bits for the space telescope. An alternate design here actually has this, you know, saucer shaped section be the habitation module. And if you really want to make references to Star Trek The Next Generation, I mean, NASA thought it was a good idea. Well, well. I don't know if they thought it was a good idea, but somebody somewhere that was associated with NASA thought this was a good enough idea to draw pictures of it. But, you know, one thing that's missing from this is it doesn't really show you how they launched the crew on this flying saucer. But elsewhere in the paper, we do have this magnificent shuttle which can carry 76 passengers. It has a double-decker cargo bay pressure module with basically airline seating so that you can put, you know, 70-odd people up to that space station that you were planning to build someday. I mean, it does look kind of cramped, but... I did the math and they actually had more leg room than I had on my flight back from Chicago last night. Of course, none of these people get window seats. But how about giving the satellites a bit more leg room? Yeah, that was a pretty easy idea. They just added another, you know, 16 feet, another section to the payload bay to make the whole thing a bit longer. The wings would stay the same size, but that green section there, you know, that added uh, like a longer pre-wing strake, I guess, that would make sure the aerodynamic center of lift was still in the correct location so that they could perform all the missions. I think this would only make sense if it also flew with the uprated boosters and a slightly extended tank to handle the extra mass. Um, and you can put them side by side here just to see how it is basically... That has the same shape of wing at the back. The only diff bit that's different is that green section that gets added and an extra section of fuselage. So they would have been relatively easy to adapt the design. Of course, by 2004, they'd stopped building space shuttles. Challenger's replacement, Endeavour, was essentially built from spare parts because they didn't have any new parts sitting around or they couldn't order them. So building a replacement shuttle would be just about as difficult as building a completely new design which uh, were able to use the existing elements. So building new orbiters probably was never going to happen one way or another. But there was a good argument for these small 
powered modules that I showed you earlier. Other radical orbital redesigns include a humpback version where you basically kept the payload bay the same width but made it taller. There was the engineless version, which was essentially similar to the Soviet Buran in that the launch vehicle would provide all the thrust and this would just be the vehicle in orbit. And uh, there was also a much smaller version, which was more, they essentially removed the payload bay and created a crewed vehicle that was able to fly in space and apparently even as far as the moon in some proposals. But, of course, none of this ever happened, which is kind of a shame for many, many reasons. Uh, least of all is because Blue Origin would be quite happy if people stopped making jokes about the shape of New Shepard. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.